Actually, all our meetings, uh, Tom usually records. Uh, he puts on the YouTube channel. He has a great YouTube channel, a lot of content. Um, and then uh, if you one of your friends miss or one of your pals, I mean, everyone else, like they want to come check it out afterwards, you know what I mean? So then you can definitely like uh, come back on track. Nice. Yeah. So, and then we have a chat, which is Amir, like I said, I told you, like he's monitor, uh, Professor Amir, he's monitoring like all the questions, you know, people typing in the questions over there, you know, but um, I, I just want to, you know, so people starting to gather around, like how was your, your start in Jiu Jitsu? What, how was your first lesson? Who brought you in? Like, uh, how was like, that's it. Well, I, I, I'm on a, I always speak that in all the meetings. So, but I was literally like sitting down at the beach in Brazil and my professor tap on my shoulder and say, Hey, you want to learn jujitsu? And I look at him and said, huh? I was just playing soccer and surfing. And a couple of years later, I'm here. What, yeah. how was for you as a female, how was your first day? How was your first intake? Did you just woke up and say, Oh, I'm going to try jujitsu, you know, how was that for you? <laughs> well, it, it didn't go like that. Um, actually, before I stepped on the mat, I had no idea what jujitsu was. I had mm -hmm. no idea what UFC was, fighting anything. Um, at the time, I had just finished college. And while I was going to school, I started to travel a little bit. And, and that's my first love. Traveling is, will always be my first love. Uh, jujitsu is my second love. And so my dad was worried. He, he had traveled himself when he was younger and he was worried, you know, look at this, this girl, I'm five foot two and, you know, white as a, a bed sheet. And he was worried that I would get in trouble during my international travels. And so he said, you need to learn a self-defense. Um, and so I was here actually in Tucson, Arizona, my hometown. And I, I started talking with a couple people. I had a friend who was doing kickboxing and Undisputed Arizona had a kickboxing class. And so I joined up, was doing kickboxing for maybe a week, maybe a week and a half. And at the same time as the cardio kickboxing class, there was a bunch of mats and they were doing jujitsu. And it was, it was uh, this tall Jesus looking guy named Jason Bukic who <laughs> was teaching the class at the time. And there was a bunch of guys and I thought, you know, that looks really interesting. And so I did my first class and absolutely fell in love. Um, my brother, my dad was a wrestler when he was young, really high level wrestler. And I would, I'd always wrestled a little bit with my brother growing up, you know, nothing serious. Um, and then, you know, I started training and Jason uh, about a month into it left to teach in like Taiwan. And that's when he brought out a buddy of his who was a purple belt at the time, Josh Hinger. And so Josh Hinger was my first jujitsu instructor for about two and a half years. So he, you know, was, he laid the foundation. Um, you know, my professor now, Andre Galvao, uh, jokes and he says, I'm, it's probably the best compliment I've ever received is he, he said, I look like a mini female Josh Hinger and it's true. You know what, excuse me to say, but you definitely look alike right now, not back in the day. <laughs> right now you definitely look like him, you know? Yeah, with the guns. Uh -huh, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Back then, I think back then he was just like, you know, like living a high school days, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he was, I mean, and that's that's how I got started and nice. it's been a wild ride since then uh, you know I've trained in Colorado I trained with cyborg out in Miami that's how I know Olivia from uh, the jiu-jitsu gypsies you know yeah. she's done a really good job running yeah. that uh, that women's open mats and events uh, organization while I've been away and then you know of course I, I trained uh, with Andre Galvao at Autos in San Diego got my black belt from Andre and, and now I'm here back here in my hometown of Tucson. That's awesome. Teaching, actually, I'm, I'm training and I teach a comp class here. Um, you'll see behind me, 10th Planet uh, Tucson is nice. kind of my home gym at the moment. I have a couple home gyms, but 10th Planet, I've been doing a lot of my work here. That's awesome. Means it's spreading love all over the place. All over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, I like it, I like it. 
Well, Heather, I'm gonna uh, let you uh, feel free for Professor Tom and Professor Amir. Uh, they wanna uh, ask in a personal question or a jujitsu question. You know, uh, we have students, you know, from all levels, all belts. Um, and this time, like, uh, we try to provide them the best as we can with uh, information, knowledge, and most of all, jujitsu. You know, so I'm very grateful for you being here. Thank you for accepting the invitation. I wanna say, you know, extend. Thanks to Olivia to make that possible. You know, uh, we merge our path and be able to meet you. I mean, I remember one time you guys did the Gypsy your, uh, anniversary at the dojo and it was pretty fun. Like everybody has mm -hmm. a great time. So hopefully everybody enjoy your class. You know, feel free to stop and uh, if you have any further questions, but most likely at this time, I just put myself a little bit aside and I'm gonna let Professor Tom and Professor Ami taking the lead if they might be but thank you very much awesome thank you i really appreciate being here it's, a, it's an honor um so heather i just I, I have one question before you get started if, if you don't mind and so i know that uh you come from uh all over the place uh is being an autos black belt really super different i know the 10th planet style is all nogi uh they have their own rubber guard their own kind of thing so when you're going there to 10th Planet Tucson and teaching, is, is it a big transition or you like both? Because I love both styles as well myself. Mm -hmm. Is that is that kind of how you feel about it? Well, it's definitely been interesting um, being here. Ten, um, here at 10th Planet Tucson, the owner, Tony Burchek, he's a former UFC fighter. I, is, um, I actually grew up with the guy. Um, <laughs> we went to, we went to the same high school together. We were in the same grade. Um, after school, he became a D1 wrestler in college. And then of course a UFC fighter. And so his, he is in the 10th planet system, which is a lot of rubber guard, a lot of leg locks, a lot of entanglements. And they do some really interesting systems where, um, the 10th planet warmups, you know, you, you go from A, B, C, D, E, all the way through this entire flow which is really cool. Um, I, you know, I've always adjusted pretty well to wherever I've been. You know, of course I've, I trained at, I, I received my brown belt from Cyborg, um, which is kind of a different style. You know, a lot of tornado guard, a lot of um, half guard and inversions. And then, you know, autos were really well known for our passing and our just smashing pressure and everything like that. And guillotines and you know coming here to Tucson I was pretty fortunate because I think at the time that I came I had the holes that I had in my game were wrestling and leg locks you know I was, I was already known for doing knee bars um, I love knee bars I was doing them at autos um, you know Dean Lister would come in and, and uh, train with us during comp class and he actually gave me a, a really slick detail on my knee bar that just changed my game. So I've picked up things from everybody and here at 10th Planet I'm picking up the leg locks which I I've never really done besides knee bars and then I'm really improving my jujitsu and I think as a, a female athlete those are two things that you know the women's jujitsu kind of doesn't have. There are a few women out there who are really experts at it, but we're more known for our, our really intense guard game. You know, as smaller individuals, I mean, the guard makes sense for us. Um, but working on my wrestling and working on my footlocks, you know, I'm a huge fan of ADCC. And, you know, I go to the, I've been to the trials since, you know, I lived in Miami six years ago. And so that I think is a, is, has been a game changer and has, is what this 10th planet system is starting to add to my game now. Um, what it means for, for other people within the academy, that's, I mean, everybody has their own journey. 10th planet has kind of known for bringing in a lot of the misfits and the <laughs> Kriyanchis and, you know, people from all over the place. And, and that's the beauty of 10th planet, I think, is, you know, they're, they're super, every 10th planet I've ever been to has been super welcoming to whoever steps on their mats. And um, so I've been pretty fortunate to have found this 10th planet and, and already have a history with Tony Burchek and, and him having the exact game that I needed to, to, to evolve. So it's been cool. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, 
yeah, that was great. That was awesome. Um, I, I'm a big advocate of trying to know as much as possible. And I, I remember as a blue belt, I studied a lot of, of 10th planet type stuff when Eddie Bravo first kind of became a, a thing. So mm -hmm. uh, I love all of it. And I, I think that's fantastic that you're, that you're doing that and kind of stepping out of the comfort zone. And I'm sure that's like that for you all the time, right? Because you travel so much and, and oh, yeah. you know, so walking into a new gym to you, uh, even as a, as you advance in belt ranking, sometimes is a little nerve wracking. So it's, it's awesome that you're willing to just over and over repeatedly put yourself in that you know, uncomfortable situation. So that's really Oh yeah, and I seek it, you know? I've always been a, a proponent of learning from whoever you can, whether it's it's been a, you know, a lower bell or, you know, a person with a vastly different game that you have. Um, there's a, a kid out here, I say he's a kid, he's a grown man, but uh, Sanchez Rivera, and he, uh, he has the most amazing guard defense. And I've just learned so much from him, you know, he's, he's probably a decade younger than me. <laughs> like has this amazing rubbery guard, which I'm not very flexible at all, but I've still been able to learn something from him. And, and I think my guards improved just training with him, trying to pass his guard. <laughs> That's awesome. That's perfect. Um, I didn't mean to hold you up, uh, Heather. If you, have, if you have a partner there, I'm not sure if you have a grappling dummy, if you don't mind showing us a move or two or something, uh, that would be awesome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I actually have my, my roommate and training partner, Kyle, here. So, Kyle, come say hi. <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> so, um, what I thought I, I was going to teach is, like I said, uh, the 10th planet at Tucson has kind of welcomed me into their fold quite a bit. And what I've been able to provide for them is kind of more an Atos style passing game. Um, so, I'm going to teach. <laughs> it's actually two moves of one of my comp class warm-ups. And so even though it's a warm-up for my comp class, um, I, I usually limit it to like some blues, mostly purple belt and above, um, but I'm going to break it down really kind of piece by piece for you guys here. It's, it, it's not an advanced flow, but it is a, a drill flow that you can do repeatedly with, you know, if you have a partner at home, um, just to kind of get some intensity and get some back and forth. What I really emphasize on my, my uh, passing game is being able to work both sides of a person, right? Um, so one of the underlying concepts is what I call Newton's third law. And it's for every action, there's an opposite e and equal reaction, right? So if I'm gonna pass, I'm never gonna try to pass on the side that I really wanna pass. I'm always gonna try to force a pass on the opposite side because it's going to create a reaction that's going to enable me to easily pass to the side that I originally wanted to, right? And I'm going to anticipate when somebody wants to, to, to defend and go to the opposite side of the person, right? I'm, I'm never trying to force anything. I'm, I'm, I'm not big enough. I'm, I'm trying to get strong. I'm lifting weights and doing deadlifts and all kinds of shit like that. But ultimately, it's economy of movement. I want to spend the least amount of energy achieving what I want to achieve. And what that entails is trying to get my partner to do what I want that person to do so that I can surf around and go to the, the positions that I want to be in without too much effort. And so I'm going to show um, one of my drills today. And we're in, I'm in Nogi. Oh. Maybe I can back up. All right. Uh, let me know if you can't see me. Um, usually I'll be in this crouching position, so this is probably like a good spot right here. So one of the drills that I do, I do a series of passing drills to back takes. And so I'm going to show a passing drill that I really like from Butterfly first. And so it's what I call a blast knee slice. So he's going to be in Butterfly, and, and we get here a lot in no group especially. Like, we don't have the benefit of the gi to grab on in no gi. And so he's going to be using his hooks. He's going to be using his grips in certain ways. So I'm going, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pack him up just a little bit, is he has active hooks, right? So if I just try to step, his hooks should be able to control me. Here. I shouldn't just be able to step past and pass. Nobody's going to allow it. So he has active hooks. The first is blast knee slice starts by getting rid of one of these hooks, right? So he has a hook here. Now it's very important that I 
I'm not just stepping over one foot because he can follow me, right? What I'm doing is I'm using my knee and I'm crossing over his shin and I'm driving his leg into his butt. What that does is if you have, pretend this is an arm or a leg, right? If you can apply pressure and create this acute angle in the leg, it's gonna take a lot more energy for them to extend and follow than if they were at a neutral position. He's in a neutral position right now. I'm gonna just take my knee over and I'm driving it to his butt. So if he turns to the side here, uh, release this leg so you can see. He has his hook in. All I'm doing is I'm taking the top of my knee, I'm coming over his shin, and look at his, his heel. His heel goes to his butt. The more that I can press his heel into his butt, the easier it is gonna be for me to just pass. And all I'm doing, so without a person, is I'm driving in and I'm bringing my own heel to my butt. Windshield wiping over and stomping right in the midline. And so I'm here, I'm pressing his heel into his butt, I'm minimizing the amount of force that he can have the following, stepping right into his butt. Now once I step into his butt, I'm going to blast his legs back with my arms at the same time that I lead my hip forward, right? So it's going to look something like that, like this. Here, step in middle, blast, and slice through. Very important that you slice through almost as if you're sliding into a base in baseball. You really want to extend that hip forward. Because if I don't, if I'm down here and I slice like this and I'm doubled over, you see this angle here? I'm not extending my hip out. I don't have enough driving force with my hips and I'm going to get caught, typically in this quarter guard half line. Now, of course, if you, you know, uh, if you're a competitor, especially if you're a 10th planet, they go over here, take a leg. That's fine. I love passing quarter guard, but that's not what we're doing. We're here, we're driving the knee down, stomping in, we're doing this blast in butt, just like that. And I'm catching myself here so that I don't put too much pressure on Kyle, but usually I'm searching for that underhook and I'm driving all of my weight into him. I'm making him carry me, right? So that's the first part of this. One more time from each angle. I'm here, I am always connected with my hands, driving down, my heel comes to my butt, and I step right in this midline. I'm blasting both legs back at the same time that I'm throwing my hips forward, boom, catching that on the hook on the other side. Just like that. Now I've passed. So I've got my three points. Of course, in IBJJF, you want to stabilize, right? And the way I stabilize, I don't want him to turn towards me like this. He can shrimp out. So I like to just pick up this elbow with my C grip here, right? And I'm just on my toes. Really key. Whenever you're applying pressure to someone, the less surface area you have into the mat, the more pressure you have into him. If I have my whole hip here and my leg and everything, I'm putting no pressure into him. As soon as I lift just half an inch, I'm putting a lot of pressure into him, right? So again, from this other side, he has these nice hooks. I take my kneecap over his shin, heel comes to my butt, stop. Blast these back, boom, right to half, or uh, side control. Picking up his arm, making sure I'm putting no pressure into him. Right? Usually with the drill, it's a little wild and hairy. So it's here, boom. I get up, here, other side, boom. I get up, other side, boom. And we do that for maybe two minutes, right? And then I have some other torture that I, I do to my, my students. But that's the first part. So on the second part, as soon as I get him over, I'm gonna anticipate that he wants the underhook and he wants to turn towards me, right? And sometimes I bait people. I want the underhook ultimately if I, it's a points game, but if it's not a points-based game, I want the back. Now, how do you get to the back from passing side control? Here, I'm doing the same thing I was doing here. Now say I gave him a little space here 
and he got that underhook. Cool. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to drive my elbow down. So I'm not trying to re pummel. That leaves a lot of space, especially if he's really good at pummeling. Pummel. I'm going to pummel and then it's a fight. Cool. I don't worry. I don't want to worry about that. So what I'm going to do is I'm driving my elbow back. I'm trapping his overarm kind of against him. And I'm bringing him up. Going to this combat base. So you'll see I have body side, outside, inside, outside. I have his, my inside leg on the knee and active toes. You see this? Outside leg is ready. Out here, facing here. I'm here. I'm just going to bring him over. Now my elbow and my knee are connected by a screen. Anywhere my leg goes, my arm follows. My arm follows, my goes, my leg follows, just like that. So the first step has to be beyond his head. Boom. Now, this knee drops as this opposite knee comes up. And I'm going to drop this elbow in front of his body. So here. And then I back step. Right? I'm blocking his shoulder. If I do not block his shoulder, he's going to get his back flat to the mat. Right? Then I'm still in side control, but I've lost what I ultimately want. So I block his shoulder. Square up, just like this. I already have this hook under or this cross hook, so I'm going to go to the seatbelt. And really important when you do this, you need to have the top of your chest against his shoulder. Um, some of you might be old enough to remember glamour shots, right? <laughs> you have to be glamour shots right on your shoulder here, because I'm using all, every single bit of my body to keep him this way. I don't want him to have an avenue coming back. I don't want him to shirt close. So I'm going to give him only one option. Let's back up. The only option being to turtle up. As soon as he turtles, I'm going to take him back. And I'll show you the back to in just a second. But we're going to face this way. And so from the beginning, Drive in, stop, last knee slides, boom. He knows that I'm going for that, he catches the underhook. Combat face. I'm pinching his arm back and I'm pushing his head down. Uh, like Pinocchio, my arm follows, just like this. So I step over his head, I drop this knee, elevate that other knee, back step, blocking his shoulder, keeping them up. Keeping it blocked, going to this side. He's going to try to struggle. He's going to try to face me. But because I have him nice and tight, I have these glamour shots going here, and the chin connected to his shoulder, he's not going anywhere. He has only one option. Turtle up. Once he turtles up, turn this way. Just, sorry, guys. There's a view for you. <laughs> so he's turtling up. My knee comes into the crook of his, this crook right here. And I'm taking this foot and dragging his leg behind. Extending this leg, keeping it through. There's my first hook. Right? And my seat fell already. I'm taking it back. Uh, wide, it kind of looks like that. So as soon as I start going, the knee slice is looking really good. Okay, let's move here. So down, last, here, here. Block, he goes with the turtle. And I'm going for the uh, choke, always. As soon as I get to the back, I don't worry about staying here very long. I'm attacking. Because if he's thinking about my attack, he's not thinking about taking my hooks out. So we'll try and take the movement. So our knees, last knee slice, so he has nice strong hooks. He comes over the shin. Drops down, blast, hips go forward, boom, he gets the underhook. Immediately in my combat base, I'm stepping over at the same time that my hand can Boom, back step, blocking that shoulder. He can't go, he can't go, he's gonna turtle up. Get my seatbelt grip. Uh, turn over. Knee comes into this little pocket. I'm not worried about taking my whole hook, just my knee. 
Opposite leg, outside leg, traps his ankle, pulls it away from his body. It locks out his hip. As soon as I fall, I'm kicking this first hook in, clamping it down. I can stay here for a second too, because I have his back, I'm connected to his back. Especially if he tries to block that hook, say where I do JJS, I get this first hook, he, exactly, he goes knee to elbow, right? I'm gonna lock this over his hip, cross my feet, get real nice and comfortable with him, and then I'm just gonna open him like a can by extending my hips forward, keeping connected to his body. Boom, hook. Cool, does anybody need to see that again? That was a lot. <laughs> This is one of my flow drills that I work in comp class. Any questions? Yeah, one more, one more time, please. Yeah, definitely. One more through. From which part? Do you want the whole thing? Yes. Yeah, cool. So I'll do uh, one more time from this view and from this view. So we're here, butterfly, kneecap over shin, heel comes to butt, stomp. Last knee slice. Drive his knees back at the top, same time that I'm driving my hips forward. So he gets the other hook here. I elevate into combat base, pushing his head away, pinching his arm close to his side so he doesn't have any strength in that other hook. I'm stepping over his head at the same time that my elbow is coming around in front of his body. Back step. I already have this other hook here. I'm popping his shoulder, keeping him on his side in the split second that it takes for me to get to glamour shots. Keeping tight. He's gonna try to get to side control. He can't. He's gonna turtle up. I stick my inside knee in that little hole, not worrying about the foot. Outside foot, traps his ankle, brings it to my own butt. That's gonna lock out his hip. See how uncomfortable he looks? Yeah. I'm kicking this bottom hook in, clamping down, locking it up. He tries to protect this outside leg, right? The one, the hook that I want. Squeeze that a little bit. The hook that I want crosses over his hip. So I'm not underneath his butt. I'm over his hip, crossing my feet. That's gonna give me the torque necessary to open him like a can of worms. Boom. He's not comfortable here. Drop my hook in. Get my four points. He's here. Got my hooks. Kneecap comes over. Heel comes the butt. Stop. Drive. Knee slice. Boom. He gets the underhook. Combat base. Pushing his head away. I'm pushing his head away from his, his back, creating a little bit of spinal confusion at the same time. I'm stepping. Same time that my arm's going around. Elbow comes in front of his body, back step. I already have this hook, blocking his shoulders. Centering up, glamour shot, he can't move, he's gonna turtle up. I'm sticking my inside knee, so this knee comes in. Outside leg, traps his ankle, drives towards me. Kicks forward, clamps down. He tries to protect, right? I come over his hip, Recross my, my ankles, open them up like a can of worms, drop it in, stay in tight. Cool? Any questions on that? How do we like that flow? I can't see anybody's answers. Are we frozen? It's mind blowing. Oh, good. Tom, I think you're definitely frozen. I'm frozen, sorry. There you are. Cool. So, um, I don't know, should I continue? I know some people are, don't have partners, some people do have partners. That, that was amazing. You, you primed me to think you were going to go to like a truck position or something, because the 10th point, <laughs> you got that. Like, oh, you're totally going to do a truck, and then you didn't. So that was awesome. Though. You, t you can, you can for sure go to truck if, you, if you, that's your game. <laughs> but I, I prefer the back. But she, she really loved all of those little details, because she's, maybe similar size, 5'4", uh, and, and that over the hip uh, with the single hook. Was, mm -hmm. we're the can opener, it. for sure. Yeah, we'll practice that with, for her as well. But that was, that was amazing. Great drill, great, 
great movement and, and real practical too. Awesome. Um, if anybody has any questions, I think I can see comments like pop up every now and then. Um, if you don't mind, because uh, a lot of people are just kind of absorbing, they don't have partners, we'll, we'll practice after the fact. And then I have okay. this record, so I just go back and watch it if we need to. But um, if you don't mind, you said you really like passing three quarter guard. Do you, do you oh, mind quarter guard. The quarter yeah. guard, do you mind showing uh, maybe one of the things that you'd like doing from there? Oh, yeah, for sure. And actually, it's, it's a very 10th planet thing. <laughs> um, or I could show actually. Um, I, I love going to the knee bar from there. You know, anytime that you have, somebody has some, one of your legs trapped, there's always a knee bar. Um, and I love the knee bar and I'll show a couple details from there, actually. Um, so if we have Kyle, and I like to force the quarter guard, force half guard. Like I am very comfortable in, in any kind of half guard position. Closed guard is my, my worst enemy, and I think a lot of my competitors already know that. That's the first place they try to put me, <laughs> it's full closed guard, which is, you know, it is what it is. But, so, at any moment, I try to force half guard, and the way I force half guard is, especially in the women's divisions, you know, somebody's going to grab a wrist and sit down. Cool. When they grab a wrist, and so let's turn, I don't engage right away, right? I really want to step, and when I step, I kind of step at a about 45 degree angle. I don't step inside. When we were doing the drill, the butterfly drill, I step inside and then I'm gone. I'm never staying right here for very long. So as soon as Sadie's standing up, up, right, he's a guard player, he's gonna just grab my wrist and sit down right away. Right? I immediately strip his grips. I don't want him to have a hold of me. I want to analyze the situation. Like I said, uh, correct reaction is an equal opposite reaction. So I like to pass this way most of the time. There you go, there are my secrets. But I'm gonna try to pass this way so that he reacts in that way. So I'm just gonna take a step this way. If he doesn't react, I'm just gonna pass there. You know, the door is wide open. So I'm gonna step this way, he reacts a little bit, and then I'm gonna come in, and you'll see that my outside hand clubs his head away from his knee. Just like that. So yeah, I can do a nice pass like this, but ultimately they're gonna elevate this leg and try to catch my pass before I can. So I'm just gonna step in. And when I step in, you might be able to see, yeah, you can see my toes. My toes are at a 45. I'm not stepping in like this. If I step in like this, then a lot of people are gonna play this reverse De La Hiva, especially in Noki or even De La Hiva guard. They like the knee pointed in a certain direction, right? So in De La Hiva, he likes to knee pointed this way, but in reverse De La Hiva, he wants to knee kind of pointed that way. So that's, that's neither here nor there. I'm gonna step in and immediately drive. I'm pushing him in. And you know, for a little person, I like to be just a touch brutal with my jujitsu because <laughs> I've trained with enough guys that I, I just don't, I'm not gentle. I'm not a gentle person, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> um, so I, I push into the mat and I drive in. Now he's going to catch this leg. He's going to catch it in this quarter guard. That's what I set him up for. If he doesn't catch it in quarter guard, I'm passed. And then he's in a really, really bad situation, right? So he's caught me in quarter guard. And he's being really tight with his underhook which is fine. I've already shown you that I, I really don't care about the underhook quite as much because if he doesn't give me the underhook, I'm going around to the back, right? So with this quarter guard, I'm gonna keep him, he's in a nice comfortable position when he's on his side, right? And that's one thing I think Tony Burtek calls it spinal confusion. And that's one thing that I, concept that I've always really loved and never had a term for. But all that means is, when I'm passing or when I'm doing a lot of the things in jiu-jitsu, you'll notice that my hips are always in line with my shoulders. When I'm passing, I'm almost like a robot, right? If you turn this way, you've taken a lot of the strength away from your spinal column. You've limited the amount of power and efficiency that your body can do, right? So that's what I want to do to him. <laughs> so I have his hips up, his hips are here, and all I'm going to do is 
I'm going to turn his body that way. And what it does, you know, turn this way just a little bit. So he's sitting up, right? I'm stepping in, boom, smashing him to the mat, being real gentle with it. His hips are in the air. You can see this. Now look at his back. I'm keeping this grip on his head, especially Nogi. A lot of, my, in Nogi, my hands are often in this nice little divot behind his neck because it's a handle. People say in Nogi, I hate Nogi because you don't have grips. You do, you just have to change it a little bit. And so what I look for is handles. Anything that has a corner, anything that has like a divot inside of it, those are Nogi grips. Those are handles, right? I can create a handle just by pinching his arm down. Right? So he's staying tight. This is my handle. I'm using my elbow. I'm driving his back to the mat. Just like that. And now with his hips elevated and his back to the mat, his spine is twisted like this. It's taking a lot of power out of him. Now, he's a big, strong guy. I'm a little girl. He's going to get, you know, annoyed that I'm kicking his butt. Right? So he's going to try to power out of this. That I'm, that's what I'm waiting for. Now he has two options. He can either realign his shoulders or bring his hips in line with his shoulders, right? And so most of the time, especially if I'm really smashing on him like this, maybe doing a nice cross face with my arms, that's common, um, he's gonna realign his, his hips. So because, turn this way a little bit, I'm here, you'll notice that my butt's kind of surfing his leg. As soon as he turns his hips, boom, I surf it right over, right? Just look at that one more time. I'm not up here. I'm not slicing down here because then I'd already be passed. He has my foot. I'm sitting on his butt. That's going to give me the surf, right? He's not going to turn if he's nice and comfortable like this with his hips in the air and his shoulders in the air. He's going to turn as soon as I confuse his spine. So the spinal confusion occurs with his hand on his neck, his elbow pushing his shoulders to the mat, like this, and smashing him, maybe cross-facing him, really making life difficult. He comes in, he's gonna turn his hips in line with his shoulders, and I'm gonna flip it over. Staying really light on his feet, this foot, when I do so, I know his, his reaction is gonna be that, so I'm going to surf my right over. As soon as I do, I come in and I'm sitting on him. Right? If you heard, he grunted a little bit. I haven't put that much coronavirus weight on, but just a little bit. So I'm sitting on him. The only weight I have into the mat are these toes right here. Right? So I'm putting everything into him. And I'm using this outside leg crossing here. Because my foot was in this quarter guard, my knee's out. I want my knee to be on the opposite side of his thigh. So I, all I do is I pull and I shuck my own foot through, right? So pull and shuck. Really important when you go to this knee bar. I want my hip to be connected to the mat instead of his. So if I roll to this side, his hips connected to the mat for my ears, right? If I roll to this side, my hips connected to the mat. Right? So it's my hip, his leg that I'm attacking, my leg, then his leg on top. If it's the other side, it's his hip, my leg, his leg, my leg on top. This, I can finish me barking here but it's not going to have a lot of strength, and he's gonna be able to belly down and defend easily, right? Now I'm gonna adjust, in the process of adjusting, maybe he gets out. If I land on this side, boom, he has less power to defend. So I really like to be with my hip on the mat first. He, this inside leg, is right up his butt crack. And I'm clamping my own heel to myself. What that's going to do is it's going to create an inward bind as well as pinching the knee and his legs going to be stuck. So if you turn this way, I land here. 
I'm here on my shoulder or on my hip, and this leg is pinching into his butt crack, just like that. I can clamp down like this, and I'm pinching like this. This is where I'm gonna take the knee bar. I have his, his leg attached to mine. If he's trying to extend it outward, I'm not going to manhandle it back to my body. I'm gonna bring my body to it. I'm gonna get this nice uh, a rear naked choke grip, grab the heel, then lean back. Keeping my knees pinched, this inside leg is clamped the entire time. You'll see his hip, if you can see it, and we'll show a different angle, is slightly elevated. Now this is the Dean Lister, and, and thank God he showed me this, because if you've seen my last Nogi uh, World's performance, is the way I, I finish it is the way he showed me. And then not just driving in, which I'll get it, there's a tap. I'm driving in, and I'm laying my shoulders flat on the mat. It's gonna come a lot faster and be a lot, a lot more brutal. So, we're here, right? I'm, I want him in quarter guard. Boom, he gets quarter guard. You'll see that, right? I'm pushing against him. I'm creating that spinal confusion by flattening the shoulders out. I'm sitting on his thigh, so as soon as I feel him start to re-untwist, I surf him all the way over. I'm taking this outside arm, the one that was here, grabbing his leg, scooting and sitting. Now I'm going to shock my leg in, and then pull his leg to me, and I'm gonna lay down so that my hip is on the mat. Boom, right? Now I'm gonna take my body to him, so I'm gonna take my body to his leg, climb up to his, his ankle, get that rear knee to choke grip, grab his heel with my hand here, and I'm not only pushing my hips in, but I'm rotating my shoulders back. Boom. Get this angle. So we're here, plug them over here. Boom. Create that spinal confusion. He's gonna re untwist. I follow him, catching myself. So you see, I immediately go to that, that leg. Now I'm gonna shuck my leg, pull everything tight, pinch down. And this inside leg's pinching between his cheeks. I'm laying on my side. I'm laying on my side. So again, the side, I wanna be on my side, not him. Good thing about rear naked choke grip, grabbing the heel, and I'm pinching down, pushing my hips out, turning my shoulders this way. Cool? Anybody need to see that again? That Any was questions? A, that was a blind, mo blind, I mean, a mind-blowing situation when you grab the heel and you change it. And I, mm -hmm. I, I was, we were talking about that, that one of the things that I never thought about it. Just yeah. to be able to grab the heel and push it to the other side. Uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, at this time, I want to say thank you to your partner to be able to be here to, you know, thank you, buddy, for uh, taking being this here. abuse. Yes. Uh, uh, just a quick question. When she turns your heel, do you feel more like your hamstring stretching or you actually feel your knee like torquing? Like the moment, yeah, the, the moment that she. It's more torque on the joint. It's more torque on the joint as opposed to like uh, tightness in the hamstring or, or like a tearing feeling. It's, it's tension. Oh. So it's almost, it's almost like a heel hook. <laughs> ah, but you know what? Leave it as it is. Don't say anybody. I mean, that part we're going to cut it up. But uh, can you repeat the. You said that uh, you like the brutal, like what did you say when you have like him on the side, like a little, uh, ah, what's the word that you use it? <laughs> brutal. <laughs> I do. I, um, you know, I, most of my career I've trained with men and even somebody who's a guy who's my same size, is going to be a little bit stronger than me, no matter how much I lift. Um, so I've kind of developed a little bit of a brutal game. And so I'm, the, and it's it's not just because I'm you know a mean person, but it it plays, <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> most of the time. 
Um, but it plays to the psychological aspect of jujitsu, right? If somebody's pushing your face away, if even in wrestling, you know, you've seen wrestlers kind of touch your forehead just like that. What that does is it puts you, your attention and your focus onto that, onto the hand on your face. You're not thinking about anything else I'm doing, right? You're reacting and maybe you're getting a little emotional because you, you don't like that. And so it's playing to the psychological element of the game and it's creating this situation where my, my opponent is gonna make a mistake a lot faster from me doing that <laughs> than you know, if I had been a, a nice, gentle player. Yeah, I know how to play gentle. You know, I, I don't run white belts off most of the time. Um, I know how to flow roll, but if I'm going in a competition, you know, I'm trying to win. That person has signed a release waiver that person is trying to do the same thing to me. You know, I am, that person's not my friend. I can hug her when we get off the mat, but on the mat, when that, you know, that referee says combache, it's game on. Especially when they say combache, that brings like old <laughs> memories. I love that. Do you see that they still keep like old school on that beginning of the match? But, I love uh, it. Yeah. Come back from the, the position, Heather. Like, when did you notice that? makes a huge difference and i think it was you prior saying like when you grab the heel and you twerk to the side i think that's a i mean that's gonna change a lot because you know the way that i was taught you always like hugging like as a gorilla grip on the leg for dear life and striking mm -hmm. your hips but that's gonna make a big difference you know like that was a great great point you know what i mean any other tips that you want to add it up on that specific position? Like, I mean, feel free of it to show to everyone else because that's, that's prime. Especially for yeah. people that actually like nogi. Uh, they want to do nogi more often. Um, and even though, like, yeah, it's kind of like a dry out as far as no gi tournaments. As we can see, we see a lot of gi tournaments. And every other day, we, you have, like, a C that they apply gi and nogi. Mm -hmm. uh, but the forum is not like as big as it is, you know what I mean? I mean, hopefully like that can be changed. Uh, but th that's what, uh, the subject to the point, like the injury coming from like somebody with the really high intensity, like moving the leg as far as sort of speed, uh, rolling with the girl, you know, and you can say that more than anybody else. I mean, uh, how, the, how does it affect you, like, when you mentioned that you always, for the long life, you're rolling with the people that's bigger than you, and you have to defend yourself, like, do you see that more, like, uh, when you're rolling, like, you, you get a good, that's a prime position, to be honest with you, like, uh, just pulling it up on the side, uh, do you feel like that, when you apply that to a guy, he said, oh, snap. She almost took my heel apart. I mean, I'm going to go hard on this girl. She's, not, she's a tough cookie. Did you feel that <laughs> when you're training? I mean, forget about tournament. Tournaments are a different specimen, you know? When you're in a tournament, I, I usually tell my student, you're in a war. You know, don't think that the guy's going to be nice with you giving ice cream before because in the end of the day, he wants to take the medal that you will desire, you're wishing, you're dreaming about yeah. it. So you, you just have to go there and get it, you know? Yeah, after the tournament, if you want to pay him an acai because he was a nice guy, he didn't crank your knee or whatever, that's great. <laughs> and then the day, like when you sign up that waiver, guess what, buddy? You're willing to take the responsibilities, you know? Do oh, you feel sure. that? Did you feel that like when you're rolling? I mean, yeah, you're rolling in many other places, but when you apply some sort of position in somebody that could be a little bit higher level than you as far as like, do you feel they go extremely aggressive with you? You know, it's, it depends, really. Um, you know, I think for the most part, if somebody has never trained with me before, they usually underestimate me. You know, I'm, I'm not a very intimidating looking person. Um, as much as I try, I just, I'm not. <laughs> and so almost every single, especially a man um, who goes with me for the first time underestimates me, you know? And, you know, to their credit, they they don't want to hurt a girl you know and so they'll usually go a little light and um you know try to be nice which you know is appreciated but at my level you know it, it sometimes it ticks me off um <laughs> but as soon as i threaten something yeah they're they're gonna go hard and you know that's it's for a lot of men it's, it's something they can't control um until they get to a higher belt you know i've had absolute wars with 
training partners who are like purple belt, brown belt, black belt, and we are going hard and they're giving me no inch. But because I know that person has quite a bit of, of self-awareness as far as their movements, I never, I never feel in danger. I know that that person, that, that guy is, he, as hard as we're going right now, that guy's going to take care of me and he's going to let go when I tap, you know? And, and I, I have an ego sometimes and, and it's, an ego's not limited to, to men, you know? Women have egos too. And, and especially at the belt that I'm at and we have a target on our back. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a guy or a girl that we're training with that person, that lower belt is going to try to prove something, you know, and that's, that's fine. That's what I did when I was younger, you know, in, in my lower belts. Um, but it is, you know, there's some times where I, I have to gauge the situation. You know, I got to say, okay, this guy probably, I can probably tap him, but does he have enough body awareness and skill development to, to not, do something unexpected. You know, I can deal with all manners of expected movements. I, I've trained with some of the highest level athletes. I, but somebody that kind of freaks out and maybe twists in the wrong way and with so much force and weight behind them, they could probably either hurt themselves or hurt me. Um, so it's, it's hit or miss. You know, I usually gauge the situation when I'm rolling with somebody of any gender. Like how much body awareness do they have? How much skills development do they have? And are they gunning for me? <laughs> are the three questions I kind of try to consider when I, I choose my training partners. Well, I guess uh, the good thing is like training many places. And if you finish a rolling and you go in the corner of the mats and with your head down and your body say, Hey, Heather, are you okay? Well, I just roll with that guy and he went extremely hard. Oh, really? What's his size? with his belt? And you look it up. That's the guy. I say, don't worry. I got you. <laughs> and then you, yeah. I'm sure you're going to have somebody going to take care of him for you. I mean, I, you don't need to worry about that, you know? Right. Um, yeah, that's, you know, that's the one kind of beautiful thing about the jiu-jitsu community. And traveling, I've been able, I've been fortunate enough to kind of really see this is it doesn't matter where I go and, and whether or not I, this is the first time I've met this person, you know, if I go to a jujitsu uh, academy, I immediately have a group of brothers and uncles and sisters, <laughs> you know, it's some sisters, you know, a lot of academies still don't have a huge uh, women's population in them, but I definitely have a, a group of uncles and brothers who are going to take care of me on and off the map. You know, somebody is going to make sure that I don't get in trouble. Um, so I've been Maybe that's the experience that I've had as, as a woman traveling in, jiu -jitsu, in the jiu-jitsu community. I'm sure that's the case for a lot of men too, you know, traveling. The jiu-jitsu family is a family, you know. It's, we speak a common language whether or not, you know, we actually speak, you know, each other's language is we speak the language of jiu-jitsu. And so in traveling, and, and that's why I'm, I'm a huge supporter of the BJJ Globetrotters because they really – welcome that traveling jujitsu kind of culture and being able to go into an academy and ha immediately have a group of friends, you know? And exactly, like you said, you know, I, I could step on the mat and, and I have, if somebody tries to be aggressive with me unnecessarily, you know, there's a point, you can be aggressive and we can have a good role, but if you're trying to smash me into the mat <laughs> because you, you know, maybe had a bad day, I have a group of brothers and uncles who are going to probably, you know, give you what you gave me. That's true. What comes around goes around. <laughs> yeah. Heather, um, since we do have a range of guys uh, and girls, you know, watching this now, but I'm sure in the future, they're going to be watching this over and over. Mm -hmm. As you're a female, as a black belt female, uh, what a what are the tips? What are the thoughts? What are the comments that the guys that are watching this, the girls that are watching this, and, and the people that in the future are going to watch this? What, what sh should be your message for, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure like some of us here, 
or whoever is watching this in the 10, 15, 20, 30 years is going to become a professor, uh, is going to grasp for everybody's ear. What, are you, what is your advice when they not just see a girl come into the door and curious about jujitsu? What, what are your advice for them? Uh, or maybe a guy that comes to the door and you might be see the guy, he doesn't profile as a person that actually might be going to last three, six months, or maybe he will until he gets his blue belt and then he quits, you know? Uh, what are your advice for the people? Number one, let's divide this. Number one, the, student, the, the, the coaches, professors, and wannabe professors that, okay, I see that guy come through the door. I see that girl through the door. What I should tell them? What I should mm -hmm. advise them? What I should help them? And for the people that are actually on that shoes, like when they, oh man, I'm going to start in tomorrow. Oh, after this class, I'm going to, next week, I'm going to sign up. You know, what should be the advice for those, those two uh, range of people in your perspective as a female? At oh, least, for sure. What you have to say about it? Yeah, um, definitely for the first group, um, for the coaches and even for the students who, you know, are actually in the Jiu-Jitsu Academy, just remember, you know, the first time that you stepped foot on the mat. For a lot of people, you know, coming into a jiu-jitsu academy, they have all these ideas of what a jiu-jitsu academy is. They're, they probably talked themselves out of coming a million times. And so for them to step through the doors, that's, that's a huge accomplishment for them. You know, they're, they're kind of probably terrified, <laughs> you know, walking through their doors. They have no idea what, they, what to do, no idea what the norms are, what they should do with their hands. You know, you see white belt hands or, you know, they, they do this. Um, but it's, it's really important for both the coach and the students to welcome them in, to, to give them as much support as possible on their first, second, third day. After the third day, they're, they're on their own. You know, they can try to figure it out. If they, they don't put the initiative forth towards figuring it, that, it out after the third or fourth day, then, you know, they need to maybe consider, <laughs> you know, whether or not they really actually want to be there. But I think, at least three days, give them all the support, all the love, show them not just what jujitsu is and as a hobby, as a sport, but what it is as a, a culture, you know, as a lifestyle, you know, show them that the people who are on the mat aren't just here because they love jujitsu, because it's, it's a fascinating activity that you can do with your, your body and your brain, but that it's a community, you know, and I think what coronavirus has kind of kind of shown all of us is, is how important our communities are. You know, we, we took it for granted, you know, when we had a place to come every day and we had our friends here. But as soon as that was taken away from us, consider how lonely we are. And so somebody coming through those doors for the first time, maybe they don't have a community like that, right? And so being able to welcome them as, as much as possible is really important. You know, put down your phone, put down your ego, don't just huddle in a group with your jujitsu friends. Is welcome that person in. Ask his name. Ask where he's from or she. You know, and then for that person coming in through the doors, like it is intimidating. You are going to get your ass handed to you for at least two or three months. <laughs> like it's not going to be easy, but it's probably the most fulfilling thing that you'll probably ever get yourself into. Um, you're going to find empowerment, especially women. You're going to find that you can do things that you never thought you could do. You know, you're going to find a community. You're going to find a group of people who actually care and love you and, and, and want you to grow and want you to achieve things. I mean, where else can we find that, especially as adults? You know, our workplace isn't the same, you know, unless we have a really tight group of friends, we don't have that. And to have that in jujitsu, it's, it's really special. And so just stick with it, stick with it for just two, three months and you'll find that it becomes easier and that, you know, all your fears you had walking through the door, they were unfounded. That's a great message. That's a great message. I'm actually tell the, the students when they walk in, I said, uh, they ask me, where's the professor? I say, I don't know, man. He's around here. I'm just like a guy that played a reggae band with the dreads, you know, like uh, <laughs> on the weekends. And they just gave me a black belt. 
and I'm just here, you know, uh, supervising the class. But you more well, than welcome to try it out the class. It's me working. I mean, I have a lot of people yeah. that really <laughs> fall into that. You know, they kind of like look at me and say, yeah, "And you, you look the part. Thing? You definitely look like you could be the leader of a reggae band." <laughs> well, I tell them Bob Marley and the and the and the waiters are like they're like my my second third generation of way back. So and they kind of like. They agree with that, you know, and sometimes <laughs> I even tell the students, I say, no, man, I'm just a DJ at night in Weirwood in Miami, and I just come here <laughs> a couple of days out of the week, you know, I show a couple of moves here, and, you know, people are liking it, you know, so um, I have my friend Tom that he's crazy that uh, every time that he has a chance, he wants to meet me there, I said, Tom, what do you want to meet to Colorado, bro? I, I'm going to do a show. I said, no, you know, you just said, no, 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 I think you're way too much, but, uh, yeah. Definitely, like, um, it's a great message, Heather. I really appreciate. I think uh, I'm going to just want to say thank you for your, your time. No, thank you for having me. This is, like I, I mentioned this to a couple people, this is the, <laughs> the first Zoom experience I've had. So I was a little intimidated coming into here um, at first, but it was, you know, this was a lot of fun and I, I really look forward to being a student on somebody else's Zoom class or, you know, um, doing more of these. So thank you. I really appreciate this and uh, for thinking of me and then having me on here. I love to share my jujitsu and, and have, being able to share this on a different platform is really exciting for me. That was awesome. I, I appreciate everything. I appreciate both of you guys, you know, without, without you, so you couldn't uh, have that class. So that was, that was amazing. Um, two things. First, you're always welcome. Both of you are always welcome to Colorado. We're in Monument, so near the Air Force Academy between Denver and Colorado Springs. So if you're ever up here, that'd be awesome. Um, and, and, you know, secondarily, I, I love the message that, that you were talking about, uh, the way you speak, the way you teach, all of that was, was fantastic. So thank you for all of that. You know, this is my daughter, and so I love showing her, you know, accomplished women jiu-jitsu athletes. Uh, you know, she loves jiu-jitsu, but, but it's nice to see, you know, uh, more of her kind. So thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And to all of you guys for listening in, um, this is exciting. I, I didn't know how many people to expect. <laughs> it was awesome. Well, cool. Um, so I think we're over time on, you know, I'm sure a bunch of you have classes to go to or your own lives to go to. <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you all and, and thank you for you for, for having me. And, and I look forward, message me whenever you know, you need ideas or, you know, tips or advice or whatever. Um, I'm pretty responsive. My Instagram's jujitsu gypsy, you know, <laughs> fits with my lifestyle. Um, but thank you all for, for joining in on the class.